That's blinding me. <laughs> um, I don't even know where I was. My name, introduction, yes. So I've been living in Chicago for nearly 14 years. I am originally from, uh, born and raised in San Francisco and the East Bay of San Francisco. Um, and I have actually been photographing uh, my entire life. And uh, this October, I will celebrate 27 years as a uh, photographer. And um, I think the first two years we can kind of take off that were not very professional since I was still in high school. Um, can everybody hear me in the back? Yeah? No? The guy behind you said, says yes. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but uh, um, I'll try to speak up. If, it, if uh, people in the back... Uh, I start mumbling, just let me know. I'll come out of my, my cloud and, and, and try to speak louder. Um, so professionally, I've been photographing uh, for 25 years. Um, I have had two different um, ways that I've made a living as a photographer. Um, I very quickly went into uh, documentary journalism and photojournalism worked as a newspaper photographer uh, until 2001 when I woke up one day and no longer had a job. Um, and I had moved here uh, from San Francisco to, uh, to work as a newspaper photographer. Um, my time at newspapers, uh, for any of you have, who have heard me before, was not fun. I don't speak highly of it. Um, I did not like the politics of working at newsrooms. Um, I love photographing people, and I love documentary photography. The minute people stop and want to pose for me, it, from day one when I was 15, when I picked up my, my camera, uh, it, it, was, um, it caused a lot of anxiety for me. So uh, naturally, I did not go into portrait photography. Um, I didn't know quite where I wanted to go with photography at the time, though. Um, so I actually enrolled in commercial uh, studio photography school um, and learned very quickly within three weeks that I did not belong in a studio. Um, I have, I don't know if I have clinical ADD, but I am way too hyper for that. Um, and trying to make bars of ivory soap look glamorous was uh, just not what I wanted to do. Um, <clears throat> so, a little bit, um, actually I want to start off, how many, um, I know that there's a wide, I think this is the first group I've spoken to that um, has a wide kind of um, group of, you know, I, I'm used to just wedding people, that's where I'm at right now. Um, so what do we have here? Do we have, is, uh, how many professionals, people who actually make a living with their cameras? Wonderful. Okay. And then how many um, people who have day jobs that are doing photography kind of on the side? And I know that sounds horrible, but, you know, we all start somewhere. Wonderful. Okay, cool. Um, one of the things I think that, um, you know, I have nothing to really sell you guys afterwards. And, and the beauty of that is I get to say whatever I want to say. Um, and I kind of have become a little known for speaking my mind. Um, and it's not that it's going to be rude or anything like that, but uh, I love to talk about the reality of what it's like to make a living with your camera. So um, you'll hear kind of how that has changed uh, from 25 years ago to today. Um, and then you'll hear a lot of how it's changed really in the last seven years to today, um, thanks to uh, digital. Um, so if there's any message worth giving to anybody who's just starting right now um, is that there's no shortcuts to photography. You can find them, you can nurture them, you can use them, but the bottom line is having your own vision and the way that you photograph and what is becoming, what becomes your style is what is going to set you apart from everybody else. And that is the key to being successful as a photographer. Um, what I want to do is actually, before I start off with, uh, go back to the history stuff, 
I want to show a little bit of the work so you have an idea of what I've been up to. Um, I'm not going to show journalism stuff. Uh, you will see portraits. Um, they were all very painful to take. <laughs> um, but you are going to see documentary. Um, my photographs are very straightforward. Um, there's not a lot of gimmicks. I don't do very heavy photoshopping. Um, I was tell uh, Jerry, right? I was telling Jerry uh, beforehand uh, a lot of the colors, and I have no idea how they're going to reproduce here, but you're welcome to get on my website, is 90% uh, old school Photoshop that I learned in 1990. Uh, levels, that's it. I don't really use a lot of actions. Um, I don't, actually I just learned layers. My studio manager just taught me layers uh, about a month ago. Um, so I'm uh, really just still doing what I've been doing for, for 23 years. Um, so I'm going to show that. Um, one of the things I think you'll also notice is I'm truly obsessed with lines. Um, I, when I was a child, before I uh, got into photography, I wanted to be an architect. Um, until I realized that you had, to do, you had to know math. At least back then you did. I don't think you have to know it now. Um, but that's what, that's what I wanted to do. I loved going downtown San Francisco with my family. Um, I loved staring at buildings. Um, and I, I, you know, looking back, I don't think I articulated it at the time, but it was the lines of the building, how everything matched up. So you're going to see a little bit about um, how anal I am about lines uh, in, the, in the slideshow. Um, do I need this? No, I don't need this. I can just do it there? Yeah, I'm going to do it.
Thank you. Um, one of the things that I was, was taught early on, I, I, you know, I taught myself photography, and, and that was all fine. Um, I decided that I was going to go to college. Um, I think because I didn't know what else to do. I mean, I knew I wanted to be a photographer, but I didn't know how to get into photography. Um, and it was through a series of um, projects that I was working on is what led me into to documentary. Um, when I was in uh, undergraduate school, I decided I was going to work on this project that um, was about street kids that lived on the streets, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds that lived on the streets of San Francisco. It was a little more social documentary than anything else, um, although I didn't know that's what I was doing. Um, I just knew that I wanted to hang out with these people. They were children um, that when I would go to the, go to the theater with my parents um, when I was 10 or 11 or 12, um, I would, you know, we would always go down Polk Street in San Francisco on the way to the theater, and there were, it was just lined with uh, street kids. Um, clearly, when I'm sitting in the backseat of a gold Mercedes, um, you wonder how a child ends up on the street. Um, and what better way than uh, to photograph them? So I did that, and I spent years with these, these kids um, and saw some very horrific uh, things. At one point I did have to take a break from it, suffering uh, from depression after I witnessed uh, one of the guys uh, literally beat the hell out of his girlfriend, um, who he was 17 and she I think was 13, 12 at the time. Um, and there was like absolutely nothing I could do about it. Um, how I really got into journalism was, um, well, how I got into photography, is, I mean, every, every little kind of step in how my career changed was actually kind of sad for somebody else. Um, so when I was 15, how I picked up a camera was, uh, I was in a boarding school, and um, one of my dorm mates uh, either accidentally died or committed suicide, um, and I wanted a picture of him. So I went to the yearbook staff. It was a small school. There's like 80 people in my school. And um, she didn't really have time, so she gave me a negative of Corey and put it into the enlarger and told me that, you know, here's the paper. You put the paper here. Here's the timer. Push the button. Put it through the, the developer. Oh, gosh, I have to do this. Developer, stop bath, and fix her. That's right. Um, goodness. And um, I remember going through that process, and I remember thinking, like, how magical is that? And nine hours later, totally obsessed, wanting the most perfect gelatin silver print, um, I called my dad. And I said, I really want to be a photographer. And luckily, uh, um, autofocus cameras were just coming out. And um, my dad, being the doctor that he is, and wanted um, a whole autofocus system, and justified it by giving me his entire Canon AE-1 setup. Um, I think Minolta had just released a year or two before that uh, autofocus cameras, which then I inherited when I was in college. Um, so, you know, somebody had to die in order for me to discover uh, photography. Maybe it would have happened later. I have no idea. Um, when I was in college and I was working on this, this project, um, this young lady, uh, Michelle, who will reappear in my story uh, in, in, a, in a second, um, really believed in this project that I was working on and wanted me to submit it to the Pictures of the Year competition, which I think is called IPOY now. Um, I don't know if anybody, does anybody know IPOY, P-O-Y-I? Um, it's the, it's kind of, at the time, I don't know what it is now, it got bought out by Kodak, which we know Kodak is Kodak. Um, at the time, it was the Super Bowl of photography, so people would uh, submit work from all over the world. I submitted the Street Kid story. We literally had uh, 48 hours, 20, well, a little less than 48 hours to do this. 
and we had to do everything on a copy stand, and she, Spirit, like, just was like, we're going to do this. We sat there with a copy stand, slides, masked it with uh, tape, because the, the actual prints don't match the actual copy slide format. Submitted it, and the next thing I knew, I won first place, and then got this scholarship to go to the University of Missouri School of Journalism. Um, I had no idea what I was, was doing. Um, I went off to the school, uh, did a great job. One of the things that happened there was there was clearly a lot of pressure. I think I felt a lot of pressure to do really well, um, considering the, um, you know, what had happened with that award, um, being wooed by this you know, top journalism school. And... Um, one of the things that I grappled with in journalism was everybody really, the, the professors really wanted me to kind of hone my style in one direction. And I kept kind of going that direction. And there were definitely some heated arguments. I stood my ground. This is how I shoot. This is how I want to shoot. They were nurturing all at the same time. Um, I do remember one professor telling me, don't worry about copying people because the bottom line is, in journalism, you can't. You can't copy anybody in journalism. Um, and the reasoning for that is things are moving. Things are happening in real time. I can try to copy them as a kind of a chase. Um, and while I'm doing that, you can hone your style. Um, and, I, and that's what I did. Um, there were a couple of famous photographers. It was great. Back then, you didn't sit on the internet. You actually had to go to the stacks in the library and pull books and sit there and study them and take photocopies that turned into what looked like Xerox and sit home and visualize what this looked like. And um, What happened at the end of journalism school is that I then was the first photographer at that school to win... Um, the O.O. McIntyre Foundation, which is actually a um, grant for writers. Um, they weren't going to actually pass me technically on my master's thesis. Uh, I think mainly because my writing was so horrible. Um, but they knew the politics behind that award, they needed to get me out of school. I could not be a student. And that award was coming at me, I think, August 18th, and I defended August 17th. Totally set that up. Like, I figure if I defend to my committee August 17th, you can't make me do revisions because you need my name behind you for this program, and then I can go on and do it. And it worked out well. So I graduated, thank God. Um, I uh, did the newspaper route, as you all know. We'll fast forward through that. Moved here to do a uh, newspaper job. Woke up one day, it was gone. And my dad called me and he said, why don't you come home? And I said, you know, this is the first time I've actually lived somewhere for a year and a half and probably, I don't even know how long, it had been years. I had traveled around all throughout my 20s uh, taking newspaper jobs three months, six months, nine months, one year, leaving them, going to new ones. I've lived in Tennessee, Washington, Missouri, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, Illinois, California. It's a lot. Um, and I decided to stay here. And my dad said something. And I was actually looking to get out of photography. I figure if I can't photograph people, I don't want to photograph anything. And I was really upset. Um, and he said, well, why don't you take your newspaper contacts, the people that you've met out in the field, why don't you do some freelance, it can't hurt, make a buck, and just figure out what's next. The problem was, is after six months, I was making all this money. I couldn't believe it. And I was having commercial shoots and editorial shoots. But then I slowly became very somewhat suicidal, realizing that I am photographing people, but they're standing at podiums, like I am right now. And that's not very interesting. Um, corporate work was, was, was boring. So one of the, the, the things that, that happened is that young lady, Michelle, who got me into uh, 
submitting my work hurt her back. She couldn't photograph, she couldn't stand, she couldn't walk, she couldn't sit, she couldn't do anything um, for a year. And she had a wedding, She's in, she was in San Francisco, she had a wedding in um, Wisconsin. So I took that event and I did it for free, which uh, it's, I'm not real proud of, but I did. Um, and I actually fell in love with it. It was the first time I think in my career that I really enjoyed doing something commercially, making money. Um, clearly, I'm not going to make money by uh, chasing a bunch of street kids or prostitutes. Prostitutes came after the street kids. I was also obsessed with these prostitutes in San Francisco as well. Um, but nobody's going to pay me to live and photograph prostitutes or street kids. So you have to figure out how to make money. Um, one of my passions is not just photographing people, but sticking with those people long enough to tell a story. So I got this gig to shoot this wedding, and she had said to me, because I was really nervous, I'd actually never even attended a wedding um, in my life, um, and she had said to me, pretend I'm your editor. Pick up your camera, go to Libby Castro's, uh, uh, her last name is Castro now, Libby Ortwine. Um, go to her wedding and tell her story. I thought, well, I know how to do that. That's simple. So I did. I showed up, I told their wedding story, and I left after 10 hours and I came home. And it was amazing. It was amazing. Um, so I quickly canned the idea of getting out of photography and just kind of kept moving in that direction. Um, one of the things I realized very quickly about weddings is that they're a lot of work. Um, and I also realized that I was now on my own um, and I'm not getting a paycheck. So you have a lot of money in the bank account and then the next month you're panicking. And um, not much has changed in uh, uh, 12, 13 years since I've been on my own. It's, it's a lot of emotional up and down. Um, but I decided to go down that road. My second wedding, I made $600. That was an incredible experience for me, to make $600 off somebody's wedding. And then you start calculating things backwards. You know, how long, how much time those people bothered you before the wedding with tons of questions, inundated with even more questions from the mother of the bride, being dragged out to Algonquin to do a site visit, which is just another banquet hall <laughs> with fire exit doors and you know exit si fire doors and exit signs and. You know, and it's two hours there, it's an hour and a half talking to them, it's two hours, you know, you start adding all this up. And then, and it was film, mind you, this is 2001, we're still shooting film. Um, having to then run it to the lab, and then put it all together, and then people did kind of very quickly want everything uploaded digitally, and then I had to sit there with a scanner, I had a Nikon gosh, 6,000 ED scanner, I think is what it was called, I can't remember. And it would um, take 45 minutes per roll of film, and you have 20 rolls of film, and you can start doing the math very quickly. Um, I became extremely bored with weddings um, after a while, realizing that when you start working backwards, you're making $5 an hour um, with no hope for uh, a retirement plan. So. It did not take me long before I realized where I wanted my business to go. And I knew, and I don't mean this to be bragging, I knew that my work was a lot better than the other photographers who were charging at that point $1,000 or $1,500. Um, it became a game to figure out how to reach a bride who has money. And that has been my focus for 12 years. It sounds horrible. Um, but people who spend money, I'm, you know, I want to be there to take it. And um, 
that's, you know, money does make the world go round. So I, um, I did not know how to do that at all. I, everything I'm going to share with you from this point forward, now that we're done with a little bit of history, is um, all my trial and error. Um, not a lot of error. I think that I could have been at the place that I'm at now a lot quicker if I had a business degree from Kellogg or GSB, maybe. Who knows? Um, but I don't. So what I did is I listened to my gut. And that's all I did for 12 years is listen to my gut. I figured I'm a, I'm a decor whore. I love decor. And if you are going to spend $110,000 on flowers, I'm there. I'm there because there are no exit signs. There are no fire doors. There, all that stuff has been erased. And, you know, the second picture that I showed, I don't, I, well, maybe I'll bring it up. If you remember, it was an Indian wedding. I'm laying down, of course, on the floor. I spent a lot of time on my stomach at weddings. Um, and they installed, I think they were like 13-foot palm trees down the aisle at the Drake um, in the Gold Coast room. And I was there. It was great. It was so exciting to be there. Um, nothing worse than being at a wedding, I thought, being at a wedding where the demands and the expectations of having a Tiffany-styled wedding on a $2,000 budget, and you're a part of it. It just became very old. Um, things started to change pretty quickly with digital. It became very much industry standard. Just shoot my wedding and give me the disc. I will go do all the albums, I will go do my own prints, I just need your eye. And I did that. I did that like everybody else does. And that wasn't very fulfilling either. Um, I got really tired when, even when I was charging 3500 which to be honest with you was not that long ago, 2008, I think I bumped my pricing up to $3,500. And having to always listen to people say, you're too much. What's your name? Steve. I'm going to use you for an example. Mm -hmm. So you charge $3,500 and you don't give an album, but Steve charges $3,400 and I get an album with two parent albums and the disc. Well, I mean, what are you buying? You know, are you buying my expertise? Are you buying my eye? Are you buying my style? I'm an artist. You are buying, you know, so there is an education, there's a, there's a lack of education and understanding and appreciation at that level. And I knew, like I said, very quickly, I wanted to get away from it. I, the client that I want is not necessarily have a lot of money. I, I like that. Um, but I want them to understand and appreciate and respect me. Because there's clearly a lot of disrespect from wedding clients, you know, I mean, how I still hear it, you know, like, I'm not spending another dime on this wedding. Fine, don't, I don't care, not me. You know, if you want an album, you gotta pay for it. So, again, I listened to my gut, and I learned you know, really what the, the, the drastic changes when I opened my studio. Um, I was kind of tinkering a little bit with getting these higher budget weddings. And I was running everything out of my house. And that was becoming complicated um, for a lot of different reasons. One, I hated working at home. I had the opposite problem, I think, that most people do. I would start work at 7.30, 8 in the morning with breakfast at my computer, and I would pry myself away at midnight. Because I always figured, if I get ahead for tomorrow, maybe I can like have a half day. But you know, I would get that half day and then start on tomorrow's work. So I couldn't separate work and home. And I did not like having my clients coming over. I didn't like it when it was the lower budget weddings either. I didn't, because then I felt like they're kind of judging me by how I live. Um, and most of my place at that time was decorated on eBay, but it looked incredible. Um, it was all this vintage kind of 50s, 
uh, you know, it's, it's like a Mad Men set um, before Mad Men came out. Um, so I felt like, oh, great, they're going to be like, well, we just gave him like $3,000 and he's going to go buy incredible furniture, um, which I did. I mean, that's what we all do. We all take our boss's money and we, you know, go buy furniture and, and dinners and stuff. But they don't need to see it. You know, it was getting uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable. I don't know if they were. I was uncomfortable. And if I'm uncomfortable, I can't sell. Um, side note on that, I get asked all the time, do I do packages or do I do collection? Uh, do I do collections or a la carte? I do collections. Why? Because when I do a la carte and I do a starting price and I see them like, tacking on this parent album, and oh, I want this album, and I want the DVD, and oh, I want this, and I want that. I'm just like, oh my gosh, they're like up at like $20,000, and they're going to freak out. But I'm freaking out. Um, so I do collections to keep my sanity. Um, I tried to do a la carte, and it failed. I didn't book anything for like four months. Um, I was like, well, okay, I tried that. So if I'm not comfortable in my own home having these people over there, and then when I started to get to these higher-end clients, they bring their parents, I was like, well, I didn't know that you know, rich kids are going to bring their parents. So now I've got these parents there, and now I'm, I feel like they're judging me because my, I live in this like, dinky condo with old glass. You know, Now it's old glass um, and old furniture bought off eBay. My partner at the time was getting a little frustrated about having to hide in the bedroom when I was doing these meetings. It just became a really complicated mess. I knew from the beginning of uh, wedding photography that I did not want to go to Starbucks. I did that for maybe three months. I would go to people's homes, I'd meet them in Starbucks. It was an awful experience. Um, my point to this is how you present yourself does is directly related to who you can attract. Whoever said don't judge a book by the cover, by its cover, lied. I'm here to tell you that. They lied. Um, we judge books, the covers of books, all the time. You know, half of where we go to dine is not just the, the food, it's the ambiance. We love ambiance. So how I got the studio is kind of a, a not really an interesting story. It had to do with Oprah, and I don't know her personally, but I happened to be at the Oprah show um, and walked out, saw an industry friend. I said, I'm jealous that you've got this studio space. And she's like, well, my studio space, my old one, is vacant again after two years. She's like, it's right around the corner. Just go check it out. And I had been tinkering with the idea of getting a studio space, but that's scary because that means you now have overhead and you have to get different forms of insurance and you have to get permits and you have to decorate this thing. And decorating, I did, unfortunately. As you can imagine, because people judge books, the covers of books. So I did... Um, I went through a whole year of rebranding. Um, I kind of prepped myself for this, this kind of moment. Um, and I, I, had, I hired a designer. I am not a professional designer. I have no reason to be making my own logo. I have no reason to be doing my own website. I'm a photographer. I, if you had brain issues right now and you were hemorrhaging, I can't do anything for you because I'm a photographer. I don't do, I'm not a doctor. So step one was to hire professionals to do the job for me. I hear so many photographers who are upset when they lose a wedding because the bride's brother is now going to take pictures. And we know how that goes. So I, um, I spent one year ripping everything apart, building everything from the ground up, um, marketing materials as well, completely out of control. Um, that was done. It was, it, that was actually a really uh, horrific experience. I mean, I was working my weddings at home, and... Um, when I would finish them, there were nights where I would have to stay up until 2, 3, 4 in the morning to do the stuff that the designers needed. 
clearly they need content, and who owns the content? I do. Pictures. So it was, it was a rough nine months, nine months to a year. That finished, three weeks later, I signed that lease on a studio. And I was thrown back into another six months, which I thought the rebranding was really hard and the studio was even worse. Um, I figured, buy furniture, get an interior designer, and they'll slap it all together, and that's not how it was. Um, so I opened the studio. It opened uh, Memorial Day weekend three years ago, this Memorial Day weekend. Um, pricing, let's go back to pricing. I woke up one day and realized that I cannot cover the bills with my current pricing. And I had to figure out something really fast. So I upped it by $1,500. Completely freaked me out. Um, the anxiety that I had felt was unbearable. Um, would I have done that if I didn't have a studio? Probably not. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I would have taken that leap, but I had no choice. Um, Opening a studio, you know, you fix one problem and then you've got more problems. And if there's anything that you can take away from my talk, let it be that. <laughs> it's really every time that I have, I have an issue and I go after it and I correct it, like, I need to get out of my house. I can't do this anymore. Let's get a studio. Well, now you have overhead. And now you have contractors who are helping you and you have to pay their bills. So the pricing thing worked. It wasn't a problem. Um, the great thing is I have consistently over 12 years, my business has always profited more than the previous year, even through the recession. Um, last year was probably the biggest uh, leap in, uh, in profit for my business. Now, I, however, have uh, not given myself a raise uh, in a long time. Um, maybe a little bit last year. Um, but the business has made uh, uh, incredible money. Um, opening the studio, you know, there, there are three different types of studios. Um, I opened myself up a boutique studio, walk-in, commercial, off the street. What that meant, what that means, I don't have a shooting space. And I decided to let go of that for decor, to wow people when they walk in, to make them feel comfortable and realize that if they're going to plunk down $10,000 or $12,000, that I'm serious about what I'm doing. My whole 12 years of doing this is, has really been to get away from the mediocre middle ground of wedding photographers. Um, and I don't mean that in a malicious way. It's if any of you are, do we have wedding photographers in here besides Gokin? Cool. So you all know if you're charging two, three, even four thousand dollars, I think is kind of average right now. Um, it's hard because that's where most of the people um, reside with their pricing, and you get that comparison going. I was so tired of being compared to Steve. It was driving me crazy. Um, I, again, wanted an educated client. Um, what happens when you raise your pricing? Here's another problem. I fixed the issue of not being able to pay bills, but now I raise my pricing, and what do you think happens? The phone does not ring as much. I used to hear, you know, well, Bob and Don Davis, they charge so much, and, well, you know, they really don't shoot that many weddings. And it's like, okay, well, hmm. Now I'm there, and I get it. The chase now is I can't advertise. I can't be on the knot. I can't be on Wedding Wire. I can't be on any of these other websites because a budget bride is going there. They're not hiring a wedding planner. Somebody who is spending a lot of money at weddings has a wedding planner. So then I had to tackle that issue. How do I get in with these wedding planners? 
the gatekeepers, the wonderful gatekeepers of the wedding industry. So I started networking like there was no tomorrow. And I truly believed that my work was solid, it was different, it stood out. I sell myself as a wedding photojournalist because I am a photojournalist. Um, not because it's a trendy word that I take candidates at your wedding. So I got in with these wedding planners. It was not fun. It was not easy. And very quickly do you start realizing that they can make or break you. So I'm trying to decide which direction I want to go with that. Um, we don't have any wedding planners here, do we? Yeah, the Kevin direction. They're your best friends and they're your worst enemy. And the higher you go on that ladder is uh, the more politics that come into play. Um, good example. I had a wedding planner. Actually, she came in right after I opened my studio. It was like one of the best moments. I needed that. She, the wedding planner called me and said, the client has a $7,000 budget. I thought, cool. That, you know, that's, that's within it. We can do it. Client comes in. They looked at these albums. Again, image. I offer um, Queensberry uh, uh, duo albums, which are not cheap for any of you who know anything about those things. So my albums compared to Steve albums, I don't know what you offer. I'm just going to use you. Um, again, an album is not an album. So if he's offering albums Walmart. with his, what's that? Walmart. Walmart. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, uh, an Asuka album. I mean, you can get an Asuka album for 80 bucks, or you can, you know, get a Queensberry, which some of them cost 1800 to $2,500 at my cost. Um, anyway, so this bride comes in with her groom, and... Um, they left with a $12,500 package because she just had to have these albums. And not only did she have to have them, but her parents had to have them. And I just sat there. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I've never sold a $12,500 package before. How did that happen? And I learned very quickly that if you're confident in what you're selling and you believe in it, I don't force anybody to do anything. I love what I offer them. And if they want it, they'll take it. And if they don't, then, then they don't. I don't really have everybody buy albums on, on that level. Uh, well, they all get Queensberry, but not parent albums and all that stuff. Um, so I learned kind of at that point that a wedding planner, when you live off of them, you, you know, you need that wedding planner, that they are kind of filtering the client and making that, giving that client um, um, a pre, uh, you know, they're kind of deciding the client's value of what they're going to spend. You know, client tells the, the, the wedding planner, I don't want to spend more than $80,000 on this wedding. Well, the planner does sit there with their calculations and they already immediately know like that how much they're going to spend on photography because they do a breakdown. It's all done by percentage. Um, the bad part about that is you may never get to see that client who might have come in and just been like, you got to be freaking kidding me. Like, I need this guy there for 10 hours, not six, and I need albums. You never know. And that, to me, is the important part of getting a client also to come in. Um, I know some people do um, phone only. I, I, I'm horrible at the phone. I don't even want to talk to you. Like, email has like, been the best thing that, that's ever happened. Um, but getting people in to see my work and see the walls and show them these albums, I wonder how many of those people outside of Adrian that I was just talking about have switched it, like thinking, ah, oh, we really cannot afford him, and then they walk out booking me. You never know. The pie choppers, they're going to get the, the menu in email and just never show up. 
And then you wonder how many of those people you could have had too. But you have to, um, is that my phone? <laughs> um, so again, getting in with wedding planners, majority of my work comes from these planners because the budget bride is on the internet. It's uh, a very, very, very difficult way of making money. And the higher that you go, then you've, of course, got wedding planners who do service day of. You have wedding planners that have clients that are only reaching a client that can spend $3,000 on weddings. I clearly want that wedding planner who has clients that have really gorgeous budgets. Um, it used to infuriate me when back in the, uh, the early days of weddings, when people would talk my pricing down and I would give it to them, and I started realizing every time I give a discount, they want more. Have you ever noticed that? It is like, are you kidding me? I just gave you $1,000 off and now you're threatening me over $250. Fine, I'm tired. Take it, I don't care. And now they want a parent album? Are you kidding me? Didn't I just get done with negotiations? And then on that rare occasion, if you finally put your foot down because you were so upset, and they'd walk. And it was the worst feeling in the world. I just gave you thousands of dollars of free product and you walked. So getting to that higher level of wedding planner, for me, it happened by accident. They actually found me on the internet. Um, they uh, were interviewing uh, Bob and Don Davis, this wedding planner, uh, had the uh, Bob and Don Davis in, and um, the client did not really like a lot of the traditional photographers that were being offered, and they went home that night, they Googled, actually, uh, I wasn't on an advertising site, but they Googled me. They came up, she called them, uh, they called Riva, Reva called me. I had no idea who she was. I knew the name, but I'd never met her. I went in, and uh, I got into her Rolodex, and things just kind of spun out of control. So you can't go to a networking event and reach these planners because they don't network at the same ones. Thursday Therapy, I think, is going on right now. They're not there. They're not there. They're so old school. They've been doing this for 30 years. They, they, their phone rings. That's all that happens. Um, they have serviced the Jews in the North Shore for so long. It's just the names come, you know, like we used Reva or Linda Alpert or any of these people, and you need to get in with those people. That's, I mean, I just stumbled on it. And um, before I knew it, I was handed off to all these other people. You start shooting beautiful events, then you have beautiful work to show, because if you just have fire doors in the background, it's really difficult for a high-end planner to look at this and say, are you kidding me? Like, where's the decor? Everything goes on decor. Um, running the studio uh, up until this year, I'm gonna be totally honest with you guys. Um, this year is probably the worst year that I have had self-employed. Um, my relationship with um, uh, Riva is not good. So that has taken a massive chunk out of my, uh, my um, uh, income. That's the word, my income. So um, again, you can be heading, heading this direction and before you know it, you are screaming straight down like somebody just tossed you off a cliff. And that's where I am today. It's a really, really, really scary place to be. Um, I have decided that I don't want to go backwards. I don't want to lower my pricing uh, to go photograph more fire doors. I'm obsessed with these fire doors, have you noticed? Um, you know, where I'm at right now and what I'm trying to do is even bigger. I got to the top planners in Chicago and I turned and I looked around and I thought, you know, this isn't it. This is not where I wanted to be. I thought this is where I wanted to be. I thought that this would cure my desire for, you know, um, 
I just, I love photography, and for me, the elements have to come together. You know, hair, makeup, decor, venue, it all helps me. Um, it's hard, I, on an occasion, I get somebody who does a, a, a low-budget wedding, and I do end up in a venue that is not decorated at all, and you start feeling a little bit of anxiety because you know that they want those pictures that were on your wall, but they also didn't spend $115,000, $125,000 on flowers alone. Um, and, that, and that's rough. So where I'm at right now is I gave myself four years, and I'm already into the second year um, of the next step. And that next step deals with not just the top planners here in Chicago, but the top planners. And when you get up to that level, there's a difference between a, a planner and an event designer. They're basically event designers are people who, um, you know, they're like Heffern and Morgan. Uh, do you guys know Heffern and Morgan, Kehoe? Um, but they're really, they're just interior designers. So they go into these places like the Plaza Hotel, which to me doesn't need to be decorated at all, but according to them it does. Um, and they have budgets for decor that are somewhere between a one and five million dollars. And that's where I thought I was headed here, but Chicago has a ceiling. Um, and I've hit that ceiling um, minus losing one planner. And, um, but regardless of that, I wasn't really satisfied. Um, Clearly, I have this passion for constantly um, pushing myself as far as I can go. And I have constantly taken risks to do that. Um, networking with people while they're in New York and in LA is very tough. So it requires a lot of my own money. You go out there, you network with them. I have been very lucky to uh, land in the laps totally by accident at an airport in Cayman um, and one happens to, two live in LA and one live in New York and um, my world has changed. Um, if you saw the Mari Lopez pictures that was all because of them. So I met them in November about a year and a half ago and two months later I'm hired to shoot Mario Lopez's wedding. So the process is a lot more painful to do that with these people because they're not here. I can't just run to the industry event downtown. Um, so it's been, it's been interesting. The politics on that level, um, who's the guy that I was talking with on Facebook today? Michael, is that his name? There you are. That was you and me that were talking, right? Here we go. Are you ready for it? Um, and then I have to kind of sort of wrap it up. Um, somebody posted in the, in the uh, he posted in, in uh, um, the, the Facebook group, do people give kickbacks to the wedding planners? There was a lot of debate over that. Um, most of the planners that I had worked with before getting to this higher end clientele, never really asked for kickbacks. I kind of heard about it, but then nobody really ever asked for it. I wasn't really convinced that planner, I really needed planners. I had one lady call me and say, do you, uh, we have a client for you, and do you offer commissions? And I was like, I'm doing just fine without you, thank you. And hung up the phone and realized, you know, five years later, I probably could have used her, um, knowing who she is now. And she doesn't use me. Um, I give kickbacks, I hate that word. The wedding planners will call it commission. Um, I like to keep it as kickback because it, I hate that word um, and I hate the kickbacks. Um, kickbacks, commissions, whatever you wanna call it, you have a choice. If you don't give it, they don't call you. So that's the bottom line. Um, I know Becker, I think you said, does not like it. Um, I don't like it either. But I don't know how much Becker shoots. I don't follow him. 
Um, I know he's much, I know he's really into the education side of photography. Um, I can tell you here, it's standard 10%. New York is standard 20 to 25% of your income. The other politics with wedding planners. It is not uncommon when you get to the next level, not the level that I'm on here, but this next one, these New York and LA people, you get paid by the planner. You tell them that your services are gonna cost 13, 15. If you work for Marcy Bloom, you can easily get 40, 50,000 for a wedding. And they turn around and they charge the client 100,000. So they not only take your commission, but they also pocket 50,000 on top of it. Is that standard all the time? No, but it does happen. The games that you have to play to be in with these people is, um, it runs deep. It's, it's um, I don't even know the right word for it. It's not something I'm proud of. It's something that at least about a once a month, I think, I think it's time to get out of this. Like just roll up that little red carpet that somebody put out for me and just be like, I'm gonna deliver pizzas, something. I don't know. Um, it doesn't feel right, um, but you're at the mercy of, the other option is to go back to three or $4,000 weddings, but that wasn't satisfying for me. Um, and the amount of weddings you have to shoot on that level to truly turn a profit is astronomical. And when I was doing that, shooting 50 weddings a year, I had no life, I had um, no money. I mean, I kind of had money, but not really. I mean, it really does all go back into the business. Um, I just wanted to be able to run a really nice, simple studio. Have a place where my clients come in that I can call my studio. I can take, get into my car at the end of the day and I can go home. It's not that much to ask for. I don't need Starbucks. I don't need a Kevin Weinstein photography at every corner, but I need one. And I also realized, and I got my other part of the goal last year, I hired an employee and I'm now responsible for feeding a face. And that comes, you know, he freed up a lot of time, right? I cured a problem, somebody to help me, and now I have to feed a face. Yeah. And right now there's no money, and that's a weird place to be. So I'm not paying myself, I'm paying my employee, because he comes first. Um, so you can see, as I said, you fix one problem, you create more problems. Sometimes you fix one problem, sometimes it creates three problems, and you're just constantly tackling them. So I don't want to give anybody the impression that you should not go into photography, but it is not a glamorous lifestyle. If you have a day job and you're doing this on the side, um, or you have great retirement money lying around, it's wonderful then. But if you're like me, who this is all I've ever done, um, it's, not, um, it's not glamorous. Um, it's very stressful. Uh, and, and even when you work for yourself, clearly there is industry politics. Um, my advice to anybody in here, um, I am so grateful that I never listened to any of those professors about changing my style. Now, what they were complaining about at the time, do I do that today? No. And it's something that I'll complain about to a second shooter if they do it. But whatever. <laughs> you know, we grow up, we get older, we become our parents. And, um, but I will say, following my heart and following my gut and following the voice in my head has led me to where I am. Because like I said, I knew that my work was solid. I knew that these awards that I had been given meant something. I knew that I was not just your average click, here's a disc, go home. You just have to prove to people somehow that you are worth the value of what you're going to charge and what you can give them. So that's, you know, that's, I just, in, in this day and age that we live in, there is a lot of people copying the trends and the styles, for those of you who are in the wedding business, 
we all know what those trends are. Um, five years ago, it was cupcakes. Um, it was vintage luggage. It was, um, you know, the one that's still out there is you, you hold out the, the little whatever sign it says, your wedding date and the bride and groom are bokeh blurry in the background and they're kissing. If you are shooting those pictures, how am I as a consumer supposed to know the difference between your photos and your photos? I don't take those pictures. I have never taken those pictures. I will not take those pictures. But I also, the great news, I don't attract a client who wants those pictures. I've never been asked. Um, there are times when I have been asked to do things that I feel like are a little bit too on trend for me, but I then do not put those on my blog. That's the other thing. Um, because once your, your blog and your website is, is your advertising, you are allowing people into, uh, you know, into your mind and how you operate and how you see. Um, digital photography, it's been rough. It's been very rough for anybody that's uh, been around long enough to do film and, you know, how studios operated back then. You know, nobody wanted their film. Nobody knew what to do with it. But now everybody knows the value of everything that you have because they're snapfish, you know. Why would I want to spend $10 on your 8x10 print or 5x7 print when I can get it on snapfish for 29 cents? People don't realize, um, you know, what we're offering as much as they used to. They used to use us as labs, and now they're not using us as labs anymore. I do not give away my DVD. That was the other thing that I stopped doing. Um, it is a, uh, and when clients ask, they say, well, why don't you give it away? Steve gives it away. And I say, well, because when I give away the DVD, I, you don't use me as your lab. I'm just honest with people. I don't really have a BS answer to give people. Um, really, what's behind it as well is that I do want to be people's lab, not just for the money, but for the quality. You hire a photographer who has good equipment, has a great eye, sees differently, then goes back and uses the computer, whatever you use. Um, I use Aperture. I'm, uh, I don't, everybody uses Lightroom. I use Aperture. Um, that final print, is, it, it's the final print. It's not like everything is glorious, and now you can just go to Snapfish. Have any of you ever sent stuff to Snapfish to see the quality? One thing that we do at my, at my studio now is we have, I was telling Neil this earlier, uh, I actually show people. It is a massive uh, four-ply, eight-ply. I can't remember. It's beautifully matted. Top picture is about 12 inches, 14 inches wide, and that is the same file. I gave it to a professional lab. I then sent that same exact file to Costco, I sent it to CVS, I sent it to Walgreens, and I sent it to Snapfish, and those are five by sevens. Same file. Every one is different. And people get it. I don't think people realize that the final print is probably the most important, because what all that work that we've done to color correct can quickly go down the drain if you're not using a professional lab. So that's one of the tactics that we use to, um, and I do lose a lot of business because of the DVD. Um, so I need to wrap it up because uh, I was told 8.15, that's 8.15 right now, that's good. Um, so that's just a little history about the studio, the politics, wedding planning, commissions. Um, not everybody does it. I can tell you that if they don't offer it, I usually give them 250 just to say thank you. Um, it's built into the package. That's, that's the sad part about the wedding planning thing. Um, not one vendor that is used to giving these commissions really is losing money. Um, the client's paying for it. Why don't the planners just charge what they're worth? Like, I don't know, photographers or florists? <laughs> I have no idea why they do that. Um, but they don't. And they'll be the first ones to tell you that if they don't, then they'll go out of business. But they're dealing with the same things that we are. There are so many wedding planners that are more than willing to do it for $1,000 or $2,000.
they need to keep their pricing low to compete with the new people that came in. Um, I do know a few in New York that don't, but they're charging fifty, sixty, and seventy-five thousand dollars to plan a wedding because they're not doing kickbacks. So you can see how much money when they do kickbacks, how much they're making. It's easy for them to get hired onto a wedding at a three thousand dollar price and walk away at the end of that wedding with seventy five thousand dollars. So, um, anyways, that is. Uh, Let's see if anybody has any questions? Any questions? I didn't realize that I was supposed to leave it open for questions. Now that it's too late, any questions? No, it's not too late. Nice. So you mentioned that you hated the politics. That's yeah, it's hard to be the photo journalism, but yet you seem to have to deal with. What was the question again? The question was that you mentioned earlier that he hated the politics in photojournalism. He was working for the newspaper. He just couldn't stand it. That was the reason why he walked away. He was glad that he was no longer doing photojournalism. But yet, nowadays, in this wedding photography business, he's dealing with it more than ever. So, how is it that you're able to cope with it now versus how you're doing? So yeah, not being not liking dealing with the wedding or the, the the journalism politics of the newsroom versus now being on my own and dealing with uh, politics from the end the wedding industry, right? Um, yeah, you know, I didn't. I, there wasn't a lot of that at the beginning, so it, it that was kind of a non-issue. It became an issue once I started realizing that I had to depend upon. Um, planners for business and I was already established so I mean this whole kind of moving over to the wedding uh, the planners didn't really happen until 2008-2009 so it's relatively recent um, I kind of just blew it off I think it was you know I, I didn't really know anybody to ask if, it, if this was normal I just they would I thought it was odd that people were asking me for my income. It seemed weird. Um, because I can tell you when I've given those wedding planners uh, uh, a wedding that I'm already on, I don't seek commission. Um, it's, you know, like I said, where I'm at today with it, I mean, I, I have days where I'm, I'm like, this is it. I'm done. Like, I'm truly about to walk. I'm kind of at a breaking point, I think, with, um, with being self-employed. It's not a great place to be, you know, between the money issue and the stress um, and these politics, you know, the politics here, but then realizing that if I do decide to go forward with this New York or L.A. thing, it's going to get a lot worse. Yeah. So I, um, it's hard sometimes to go to bed at night. Yeah. I mean, I have morals like everybody else. And... But I also need to eat. It, it sounds a lot like you're a, a destination photographer that that needs to move to that space. I like a lot of what you've explained and what you envision of the places and the people and the money and what you want to photograph. And I'm wondering, you know, how or if you have begun or looked at tapping into that in a way. And if what your what your thoughts are about that? Because it, that that's completely you know decor, huge budget. Usually money is absolutely no issue at all. Right. And you're looking at clients who, who have you know they could hire anybody to plan. Right. A slight comment also. I, I came from uh, music industry as well, photography, oh, gosh. and I know the people you're talking about. I've worked with them, and I've seen that throughout the whole industry. Yeah. Eighty percent of the people I work with and, and dealt with in one way or another always wanted money in one way or another. Either okay. They would tell me they were going to add this if the client asks right. you, or they want you know some side kickback. So that just seemed to be absolutely part of the fabric. I don't know if everybody else feels that, but I, I see it a lot. Yeah, and that's why I just... That's a long one. I may have to ask him to stand up and do that one. I, I don't know if I could repeat that. He was just basically... Um, I don't even know. It wasn't really a question. It was more of a... I was about the idea of... Let's just go on that one thing. 
destination wedding, it seems that that's what you're describing, the type of clients you're looking for and the kind of places where you want to be photographing. And I'm just wondering if and how that might fit into your forward-looking plans. Destination work. He was asking about destination work. I, um, my wedding photographer, I got married uh, just almost a year ago. My wedding photographer, that's all he does is destination work. He's from San Francisco. Just because I'm from there did not mean I, I, I did not know him. Um, in fact, he did not live in San Francisco when I was there. But that is 99% of what he does. He rarely ever works in San Francisco. Um, I'm not quite sure I want that lifestyle. Um, he usually has to leave on Wednesday or Thursday, usually Wednesday if it's out of the country, Thursday if it's U.S., and then he's not back until Monday, and then he's, you know, two days later up at, at it again. <clears throat> I, that would not uh, go over well for me. Um, I'm a creature of habit. I eat the same thing every morning. I'm not kidding. Every day. And when one of those ingredients runs out, it's, it's panic. <laughs> um, today I realized I did not replenish my ricotta cheese and it was not a good scene um, so as you can imagine and I actually travel with some of my food because some of it's hard to figure out where to find it I'm not even a vegan it's so bizarre um, so no I don't think destination would be a good way for me to make a living um, I am looking to get out of Chicago yeah that's the goal. The goal was four years, and I, now I have two years. Um, and I'm thinking with the housing market and the way I'm looking at my condo being underwater, I'm probably not going to be leaving here in two years. I have no idea. Um, I would like to end up where I want to shoot mostly. Now, if those clients want to go to Italy and have a wedding, by all means, I'll go. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, we have a lot of young photographers here. And we talk about time being money. Mm -hmm. We talk about time management is almost like money management. Mm -hmm. How do you manage your time and money uh, on your computer? Do you hire people to do that for you? How do you do that? Do I hire people to do what? Your accounting. How, oh. do, you, how, how do you keep track of your expenses? And how do you manage your time in daily basis? Yeah, that's a good one. Again, no different than uh, rebranding and no different than decorating the studio. Designer did my rebranding. Interior designer did my studio. Um, I have uh, an attorney who handles all my legal issues. Uh, last year, uh, I exercised him a lot. Um, and um, I have a bookkeeper, which is different than an accountant. Um, so I have a bookkeeper who keeps my books. He comes by once a month. He has access to all my credit card information, all my bank information. I tried to do it myself um, until two years ago, and I made matters a lot worse. Like I would think, wow, I only owe $7,000 in taxes when you really owed like 22000 and that's a lot of money to come up with on April 14th. Um, so I figured, great investment. $350 a month, my bookkeeper comes by, I meet with him, and he goes about his way. At the end of the year, he takes those files, he sends it to my accountant. My accountant then tells me that you owe twenty-two thousand dollars, or whatever it is. It's not really that much, but um, but yeah, I have people handle all that. I don't deal with any of it, especially since I was also missing write-off stuff as well, and I'm horrible with receipts. Um, so giving him access to my account is. Uh, was the best option for me. Great. Yeah. And then, you know, having an employee is like taking, you know, like, I don't post-process anymore. It's wonderful. I call because it's, I need to be able to one choose those images, but I don't touch post-processing. Now, anything that you see on my website, if you go home, I promise you they look a lot better than they do on that screen. Um, anything that goes into an album or on my website, blog post, whatever, that's all done by me. And that's actually not done in Lightroom or uh, Aperture. That's actually done in old-fashioned Photoshop. And I sit there sometimes for an hour on pictures. And I will literally do that marquee selection. And that's the way I learned in the 90s. And I still do that. Yeah. Having help is wonderful. That was going to be my question about post-processing. What you still, you, you do your own editing. Uh, and, and you say you spend more time on your files now. Earlier you said adjustment, maybe a little contractor, 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, all, it, a lot of it is a lot of the time, at least when I'm doing it, is selections and getting the feathering right. And I'm sure somebody, if I use layers, maybe it'd be better. I don't know. Um, it, it, yeah, a lot of it is uh, levels adjustment, but you know, it's like old-fashioned printing in the dark room. You know, you have that big board to block the light, and it needs to come through to burn, and then you have to dodge, and and that's really all I'm doing is burning and dodging and adding contrast. And um, you know, if you get on my site, I, I love color. Like I have to have color. Um, I love black and white too. You'll see some black and white on there. Let's say you have what twelve hundred. Usually uh, for S800, yeah. Okay. How much time do you spend on the picture? Or do you select files that you spend more time with? It'll take, um, so I cull it. So I do the initial, like, I shoot a lot. I shoot, like, I don't know, 4,500 to 66,000 photos at a wedding. How much is the bright time you see? 800. Yeah. I used to get in trouble at newspapers with that too. It got to the point where they would hand me like three rolls of film and they're like, that's it. Because I would literally come back with like a whole 20 rolls of film off of a 45 minute assignment. So that's just the way I've always been. Um, so I call it, I edit it down to about 800 and then I hand that to my studio manager. And he does the, the color corrections and aperture. And then when I blog or I'm doing an album, I actually go back to that raw file and I start from scratch. Yeah, so you preserve your raw files on external yeah. yeah. We have a, um, a server okay. with, uh, I, um, I think we have like 60 somewhat terabytes of yeah. drives going all at one time. Wow. Did you say you, you handed it over to, who did you say you handed it over to? A studio manager, my employee. Oh, so that's your employee? Yeah. Like an in-house person? Yeah. Yeah, so he does it. And how long it takes him depends upon what mood he's in. It's a painful job. You know, I, I get it. It's not fun. And there are days where he's just not in the best mood. And, and that's something you have to trust. Do it too Yeah. But I'm sitting right there. Yeah. Uh, she asked if I back up off-site. Um, I do in kind of a roundabout way. Um, uh, of those 60 somewhat terabytes, um, it is also redundant. Um, so what comes home with me, um, and I rotate it once a week, um, is uh, the raw files. So my initial dumping of all last Saturday's wedding goes on to uh, a disk that's just actually called RAW, RAW 2013, and it's uh, redundant three times. So if anything were to happen to the Aperture Library, as we all know, these libraries can go wacky sometimes, um, I at least have the RAW file. One of them is kept at home. One is kept up in the cupboard, and the other ones are kept in the um, in the server. Yeah. When you call down your wedding collection for a client, you say you know on average you show the, the clients about eight hundred. To me, that just seems like sensory overload. So, yeah. Uh, and I'm not criticizing. No, go for it, because I agree. <laughs> what do you hope to get by showing? Aside from sales, you know, that many images. To me, I think, you know, maybe, you know, two to four hundred images will be something more manageable to a client, especially when you're dealing with clients that you have to. Yeah. Um, why 800? Well, um, well why, why so many? Why, you know? Because it's industry standard. You know, when I shot uh, film 10 years ago, 12 years ago doing this, um, you know, you shot on average 20 rolls of film at a nine hour wedding. And 20 times 36 is 720 frames. I can shoot that now by the time she's got her dress on. I know it's really scary. Yeah, it's horrible. Um, but when you have 720 pictures in film, we were presenting two to four hundred 
Um, and it was great. Nobody ever complained about it, never heard, aren't there any more? Are there more? Are there more? So why do I do it now? To shut people up. <laughs> that's really? A, that's a great answer. I mean, that's, that's why I do it. Are you, are you doing it with 8x10s or 5x7s or like how are you presenting these to clients with just your story? We, um, so yeah, we take, we don't do that anymore, thank God. That was really expensive. <laughs> um, we used to have to make 4x6 proof prints, like real proof prints. Um, now we bind, uh, we have eight images on a page, eight and a half uh, by 11 page. It's a hardbound book that we have made for them. Um, and it starts with image one, all categorized, preparation, the ceremony, uh, portraits, cocktail hour, first dances, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's really just a, a nice book about this big or that thick. And it has 800. They'll get um, their, high, their low res files watermarked um, at the, uh, when it's all ready to be released. So they'll have the digital uh, watermarked versions. They'll also get that uh, bound little album. Um, What's low res? Low res. What does it mean? 72, 72 DPI, and it's probably like that big. Like if they even switched it to 200 DPI or 250, they're going to get like a one by three. That's not much to, to print on. Um, high res is, you know, 16, 20, 50 megabytes. Um, it's industry standard. I mean, even at 800, I get complaints occasionally. You know, my friend had a photographer and they gave us 1,200. <laughs> People don't know why they need 1,200. People don't even know why they need 800. But it's industry standard. There are certain things I will fight. That's not one of them. I'm not going to fight it. I do, what I started doing, again, benefit of having an employee, one of the things that we've done, because it is an issue, it's a huge, that's a huge issue with me, um, the amount of pictures. It terrifies people. They don't even know what they're looking for. Um, one of the things that we do now is um, I had my uh, developer build a private spot in my website. None of you will ever find it. You can't find it. It's like not linked. There's no tabs. Client gets married. We're all ready to go. They have their own website within my website. And it has this beautiful picture of them, has their name, and then there's a whole bunch of links on the left-hand side. First link is to download your web-ready files. And they can do that. And it's great. Built-in little check thing that they've, you know, they can't download it until they've read the little copyright disclaimer, what you can do with them, what you can't. They can download those. They can link to their blog post. They can link to their slideshow. They can link to a pre-album design that we keep around 125 to 150 images. Those images are then put into also a artist favorites folder. We just started doing that last October, and it has changed a lot. It hasn't changed everything, but it's changed a lot. It's been great because our clients are spending more time in that 150 image folder than they are in the other ones. And that pre-album design, people who bought 50 image albums can't get that 150 image album down now because instead of just releasing 800 pictures and then wondering why nobody is upgrading from their 50 image album, you know, would you? I mean, if you don't know anything about photography, that is rough to give that to a client. But giving them the ability in this software program that we run to actually, and it can go full screen, you could just enlarge it full screen, and to see a book with your images, flipping pages. It's wonderful. What kind of software do you use? Oh. What um, kind of software do you use? You'll have to email me. There is, you know, the other the one downside of having an employee, I'm not kidding, I don't understand half of what we do anymore. <laughs> I'm horrible with a lot of technology. I get very, very anxious and overwhelmed. So when we implemented a lot of this stuff that I just mentioned, slideshows and albums, uh, album pre-design, I would say, you do it. You figure it out. You research it. You narrow it down. You figure which ones are going to be the easiest because he's building it. I don't do any of that stuff. Um, so he, he, would, he would know. But I mean, it would take me two seconds to figure it out. But if you email me, I can get that to you. 
Photojunk from Queensberry, we used that to make the Queensberry stuff. It didn't have the output that we needed for the slideshow, um, for the album pre-design. It was complicated. Yes, sir. Yes, Neil. Um, I'm curious about not now that you shoot weddings, but in the sales process, I have a similar issue that's similar to what I've heard many wedding photographers have, which is, you know, bride and bride and groom are going to Right. Okay, now, now she has to be human, and, and she goes, Dad, I love this photographer. Oh, by the way, it costs $12,000. Okay. So how do you handle not having a decision maker in the room when you're doing your, your, your stuff? It hasn't really been an issue. So he was asking um, uh, how, uh, how, how I'm able to sell to a client the, you know, to a bride and groom, they walk away, it's going to be $12,000, they go to the mom and dad who weren't there, and now I'm getting a phone call, and how I deal with that. I don't really, I have not really had that issue. I guess because if um, the parents are that involved, they're going to be there at the meeting. Um, but do, you, do you insist on that? No. You ask that question no. No. I, um... I, I, um, I, you know, I've met some, you know, I, I don't really have any bridezilla stories. I don't know of any wedding photographer. I really don't. But my God, I've got parent stories. Parent stories that, like, I fled the state, like, last July. I was like, I got to get out of here. Like, this guy is freaking me out. Um, it was the dad. Um, so I did. I really, I laughed for five days just to clear my head. Um, oh, my gosh. Anyways, I'll come back now and answer your question. <laughs> Just like cannot get that man out of my head. Uh, no, I don't encourage them to come. I don't. I, you know, things are very different. You would think that because you're shooting a high-end wedding, they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, that they're going to all be assholes. Um, and the bottom line is, sorry, there's like a young <laughs> person up here. You've heard the, the word before. Um, if not, then okay, good, good. Um, I, what was I? What was I talking about? What was it? I was talking about assholes. You would, you would expect. I mean, I hear people say that to me all the time. Like, God, you must deal with some really big assholes. And really, I don't. The joy of it, really, it came true. They understand me. I shot a wedding in November where the mom and the dad and the bride and the groom were calling me all the time, crying. I've never had that happen before. Not on that level. But I realized that I had hit that level of people who can appreciate what I do. Um, I had more problems charging less. The demands that people put on you as you're driving to that banquet hall in Algonquin, let's go back there again. I mean, it's, it's tough. I would listen to that. That's what I have those people to thank. Because that's what pushed me to get to where I am today. I was like, I don't want to work for you. I don't like you. And I don't really have that problem today. I, now, to say that I don't have problematic clients at all is, is wrong. But... The parents, it's not that big of a deal. They're usually, they're usually a joy to be around. Um, except last July. <laughs> Actually, you know, the funny part is, is that it was a May wedding. It was May 12th, and I got married on May 13th. And I had spent literally, I think, 18 hours with a man who um, totally deserves to, to, to be buried alive. Um, and I'd like to be there to listen to the sounds he is a mean mean man and, but I love the pictures because um, two of them were of uh, him and his daughter up there but whatever he thought differently um, actually the issue with him is that there wasn't enough pictures of him because it was all about him um, 
I hadn't even spoken to these people in like nine months, and I called them, you know, his daughter gives me the timeline, I'm like, oh my gosh, you only contracted like 13 or 14 hours, and really, you need like 16 or 17, so I sent them a bill. <laughs> Oops. I guess you don't send a bill to that man. I mean, he was like F-bombing the entire conversation, so it like, he hated me before I even shot the wedding. So it wasn't even an issue of my pictures. He was, you know, threatening me and, and all that stuff. So um, I got to exercise my attorney. Any more? Oh, gosh. I know. Um, I, uh, I, I, I clearly, my first camera was a Canon A1. Um, my first autofocus camera was that horrible, horrible Minolta one that my dad got um, when he was upgrading. Um, and I realized very quickly, I'm a gear junkie. I don't know about any of you guys. Um, I know that people say cameras don't take pictures. People do. Um, I cannot make any of those pictures with a Rebel T3i. I don't even know where we are with the Rebel series. I cannot make those pictures with a 16 to 500 millimeter zoom 8.0. I can't. Um, so I love gear. Um, I don't go overboard with gear. Um, but when I am buying gear, I'm buying it because I know that it is going to uh, allow me to achieve those images more efficiently or as we can do now, shoot with ISOs that are just so crazy. Um, 52,000, I think, is what we can go at right now before it starts to really degrade. Um, so I'm a gear junkie. Um, I, I truly believe that gear helps us all. Um, I shoot Canon, and that is only because when I switched to digital, Nikon sucked. Nikon was, uh, what was this, eight, ten years ago, I think I went digital eight, eight or nine years ago nine years ago. Um, Nikon was nowhere near it. Rule number one for a digital camera for me was uh, full frame. Not doing crop sensor. My, eight, my 28 millimeter lens, I know exactly where I need to stand for somebody who is six foot one, somebody who is five foot five at a horizontal, I know exactly where I need to stand. You give me a crop sensor, and you might as well send me back to photo school 101. I'm not doing it. I've shot with crop sensors. They're horrible. Um, so I did go Canon. I woke up one day and spent uh, over $30,000 in five minutes. It was great. <laughs> it was great. Um, do I love Canon? I'm not going back to Nikon. <laughs> I, I, I almost did last year. I almost did last year. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's one or the other. There are things that Canon does that Nikon doesn't. There are things that Nikon does that Canon doesn't. The gap is not as much as 10 years ago. Yeah. And I'm thrilled that Nikon caught up. I really am. You know, um, it wasn't until recently. I will take all the abuse from Nikon people because really they had nothing to brag about for a decade. Um, so I will give them <laughs> something to brag about. Um, you know, I think Nikon, I mean, really, they were going under. They were like, go in the way of Minolta. They needed a digital camera that was going to kick some butt. Um, and they did it. And not only did they do it, but they surpassed Canon. With, I don't remember what that was, D3 or something like that. Um, the great news for Canon is that they can't just sit back and cross their legs anymore. <laughs> And are their autofocus issues uh, resolved? No. No. I have a 1DX. I have two of them. It's better, but it's not great. And then I play with a Nikon D4, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Like a, you know, like a baby in a dark closet can like, find the focus point on this thing, and everything is sharp. Like, what's that about? You know, and in broad daylight with a Canon, it's like... Dzz, 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 dzz. <laughs> um, and you'll notice I shoot wide open. All my lenses are prime. I shoot at 1.4, 1 1.2, 1 um, and I do it with Canon. <laughs> it's really tough. Yeah. I, <laughs> there are times where I really think I, maybe the investment into Nikon would be nice, but 
I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I know that the money is not there this year, thanks to Reba. <laughs> <laughs> I use a lot of lights. Yeah, I usually have um, five Canon strobes with me and three to four quantum strobes with me. I'm a lighting fanatic. Now, do I really know how to use it to its fullest uh, extent? No. Um, I am a TTL wizard. Um, yeah, <laughs> my, I sent my, uh, my employee to his, his, uh, his class. Um, you know, uh, I've been in a, in a funk, really, for like two years creatively. This year, it's business and creative funk. Um, but what I decided to do in the slow time that I've had over the last couple months is truly go back to the basics of lighting. And I did that because I sent my, my, my employee to Bill's class, and I thought, what, what the hell did I just do that for? I sent my employee to this class, and yet I want to know this stuff. So we have been playing almost every day with all this lighting gear that I, and I'm really starting from scratch. Manual, manual flash, who knew? I mean, it's bizarre. And I'm having the time of my life. I know what I want my flashes to do. I have a very certain style when I strobe. Um, but that's not what this is about right now. I truly am enjoying being in photo 101, I mean, I spend 10 hours a day. Sometimes on the weekends, I don't even leave my place. And I'm just researching and reading and watching videos. And it's really bizarre. I haven't done that in a decade. Taught myself something new in photography. I was bored because it was all boring. I know exactly, looking at you, I know exactly what lens I'm going to photograph with. I know exactly where I'm going to stand. I know I'm going to kneel down because there's this horrible, like, stick coming up over your head in the way back. I know exactly how to approach it, and that gets boring. If you know, if you're breathing photography, it gets boring. So I'm stepping back and shaking things up right now, trying to teach myself lighting. It's really rough. Posing, yeah. Okay, so how do you get around that? Oh, God. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard because, well, I don't mind the formals. Because those, to me, it's like a conveyor belt. Next, next. It's the creative stuff that you need to do with a bride and groom in a wedding party. Because you don't want it to be all just standing there. They want something creative, you know. But my clients also don't really like the posing. They don't want all that over-the-top cheesy, you know, Foreheads together, close your eyes, you know, the strobe is behind them all backlit, the rain coming down. They don't want that stuff, which is great, but they kind of need direction. Otherwise, they're just standing there. And um, I panic every Saturday around 3 p.m. <laughs> I do, yeah. If you ever meet my employee, I mean, there are times... I mean, right. yeah, I mean, there are times where I'm just like, God, the light's not right, and my strobes aren't working, and I can't get anything to work, and I'll look over at Ricky, and he'll just be like, oh, God. I mean, he really... I had a panic attack at Mario Lopez's wedding during the formals where there was so much radioactivity going on, it had shut down my radio because TLC was uh, filming it. And I had literally, no joke, two minutes to do these formals for Us Weekly and nothing is working. And I completely freaked out. And I, and I have a radio in my ear, and I'm trying to radio Ricky, who's not answering, and I don't understand why the strobes aren't going off. And I go over there, and he was just, he literally had entered a panic attack, because he knew I was panicking. Yeah. I just, you know, I do what I can. Clearly, the more successful ones are going to be a client that is comfortable being organic, with their partner. Isn't that the goal of these portraits? I would think so. Um, when they're not, it, it's tough on me. But I've been doing this for, for again, 25 years. I just kind of, that's why people hire pros, because we know how to put out fires. But it's not fun, that part. Yeah, it's rough. Your 
certainly financially within it. What is the, how do you approach the psychology of it? Like, is this a psychological assessment or like, are you studying this group of people as your clients so that you can come back the next time and understand exactly what it is that they're looking for? Because not as a photographer, I understand what you're talking about in that maybe these people don't want to do those, you know, cheeky poses and different things for their album. I think they feel important enough and like their thinking is on such a level, they don't have time for that stuff. They just want you there and they want you to capture the key moments and they just expect you to make it work. How do you deal with that from a psychological perspective? I'm not quite sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, the first, the first step is to figure out what the question was. So, yeah. They don't want to be bothered with you posing them. Well, that was the case with Mario, 100%. You know, what am I? I'm a wedding photographer. I, that, that guy gets photographed by top photographers daily who are far better than I am in the studio. Um, so, no, he did not want to do these pictures at all. He could care less. Um, but an average client that's spending a lot of money, sometimes they book three hours to do it. That client that I talked about, uh, that the parents and the bride and the groom, they kept calling me over and over and over, crying, getting all these emails, they had a three and a half hour portrait session. And I made it through it. And I was lucky that everybody is so gregarious and so in love with each other. I didn't really have to do all that much just had to pick backdrops. Yeah. Um, but that probably didn't answer your question, did it? No? Uh, kind of. It, it, where I work, you know, there are certain levels of people. I, I have two jobs and a part-time job is where the people that pay, you know, $200 for a ticket and they don't care about the money, they have a certain attitude about how they're supposed to be treated. And the people that are all Sixth floor, you know, they come in, they're just happy to be there, and they're trying to get every deal that they can to enhance the experience. You know, there's a psychology behind that, and right. do you uh, deal with it from a psychological perspective and making your experience, well, their experience better as your services being so intimate? Whew. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I heard that same thing. I was curious about it when you talked about you know, the issues of posing and how the people are connected and that spirit. And I'm working on a project that deals with photographing lots of couples in a short space of time. Okay. And one of the things <clears throat> that might address this and something that I'm I'm learning and working with is suggesting things for them to just think about and telling them, I don't want them looking at me all the time. I want them focused on themselves. Mm -hmm. I want them to really connect and try to look with their eyes and not even talk. And I started to notice more and more this issue, when you talk about kind of the psychology, that when they, people will sit down and they're going to present themselves to me, which is what I don't want. And then as soon as they get it, that, oh, I'm, I'm going to pay attention to it. Oh, yeah. I, you know, and they plug in and they're not conscious of the fact that you're there. You can start to lose that somehow. Right. And this deals maybe with what <clears throat> you're talking about, or maybe not. But I'm wondering, do you, do you use different types of, of things to, to get them focused on each other? And also things like, you know, think about the very first time you saw each other. Think about your first date. Think about the first time you... And, you know, and then they start to kind of activate in a different way. A totally yeah, different. He does that kind of... Is that something, are you getting it? Is, are you talking about that in psychology? No, it's, it's, it's not deeper than that. It's <laughs> okay. We'll talk about it at the party. We'll talk about it at the party. Yeah, obviously it is to me, but it, it kind of deals with it. It kind of deals with money, really status, and, you know, societal, you know, hierarchy. I think that everybody is slightly different. I mean, I've worked with some very wealthy people who are easy, and I've worked with some where I, I'm not really allowed to talk to them. I didn't really talk with them at all. I was hired through an event planner or a designer. So there is a separation. So then you kind of show up, and you're like, oh, my God, that's what you look like. You know, um, 
you know, to go on what you said, and then I'll, I'll let you go back. I'll make this quick. <clears throat> um, I actually draw on a little of uh, the psychology that I kind of learned when I was at newspaper work. Whenever you uh, got sent to a preschool or kindergarten, first grade, second grade, they, they can't stop staring at you. It's just constant, like, hamming for the camera, hamming for the camera. Wait 10 minutes. Kids ADD kick in, and then they don't care about you anymore. You are old news. So I kind of use that at weddings sometimes, actually a lot. Um, try to break them down. I don't really give them anything to talk about, but I do give them a little pep talk. I tell them that this is going to feel awkward, but I promise you, those pictures that are on my website, you're going to get them. You just can't feel it right now because you are living in this space. I can see Gokin over here. You know, I can see this light over here. I'm looking at you, but I can see her. It's all distracting me. It all looks familiar to me. Um, what happens when you, like, take a picture and all of a sudden it's just that? And then it's lens choice, you know, all that kind of stuff. So on an occasion I'll show them a picture. Like, this is what it's going to look like. You have to be careful with that, though. Because if they think their arm looks fat when they weigh like 80 pounds, you're screwed for the rest of the day. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I play by ear because everybody's very different. But I usually try to break them down, give them time. I tell them that everybody feels stupid during this. I felt stupid. I hated getting the portraits taken at my wedding. And they look amazing. You know, and I was like, wow, I never... Yeah. They just need to trust me that if, you know, they mellow out, if, they, if they're going to stress about it the whole time, I, they're going to have stressed pictures. But if they just mellow out, they trust me, I'm the professional, I've been doing this, just let go. Let go. The best pictures are happening when they're probably talking to each other about how stupid they feel, when they laugh. I'm not shooting video. Bam. It's done. Let's go. You know? And everybody looks at the picture like, oh, they're so in love. <laughs> yeah, so like this guy. He's back. I mean, he was doing this to me earlier. I don't even know who he is. Um, That's even better. So it's just... And then he runs into the man photo uh, uh, display. <laughs> Free tripod heads for everybody on the way out. Okay. I, was I supposed to give the time for questions and answers? You did not tell me that. You said be done by 8.15. We got, we, got, we got deep into the philosophy and psychology behind a lot of things. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of things to give away, and I would like you to pick the first one. Um, oh, me? Oh, yeah, please. Look at the, the blue light. The blue light. I'm smart, I'm smart. All right. Get your tickets ready, because the first one is going to be a uh, $50 gift card from uh, Cali Mac. And... Can't pick your own number. <laughs> I didn't. I'm kidding. I just want to remind you all: whoever gets cash, take the mission. Guys, we're so wild. Well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I want 25 percent. I'm pretending I'm in New York. Because really, 10 percent of five. Okay, last four digits: six, three, three, eight. Six, three, three, eight. Oh. Terry? Oh. No. no. <laughs> Okay, the next one actually is something we promised uh, last month is a one year membership from Chicago Photography Center. All right, go for it. I can't get 10% of that. <laughs> I get one more. Uh, six, three, four, two. Four, two. All right, come on, get All right. All right. I'm going to have him uh, take that. You get a sticky note. Sticky note. <laughs> All right. Email me, we'll hook you up. <coughs> Mike, email me with that, I'll hook okay. you up. The last one, last one is... Well, you're an aperture person, but this is going to be uh, Lightroom presets. It's called Color Fantasies, all right? From one of our sponsors, <clears throat> uh, Sign Effects. And I use them. 
all the time. Color fantasy. Color fantasy. All very good. It right? sounds pretty yeah. awesome. Do they get a class with you? How do you use that? You don't need a class with that. And okay. I promise you, it'll be a lot faster than doing it by hand with a little uh, that marking tool. Okay. Fantasy action. Six, three, one, seven. One, seven. Oh, one, seven. There you go. All right. Email me. All right. Well, here's the thing. Uh, last year, last year when I sat down 